みなさん、おはようございます。Welcome to Jarvis in Japan podcast. Podcast from me, Jarvis, give you information about Japan and right now I'm still in Okinawa. So before I leave, I thought I'll record several podcasts about stuff I've learned about Okinawa while I've been here. And one thing I've learned and found quite interesting is Okinawa, Okinawa Prefecture. What was Okinawa before it was Okinawa Prefecture? What was that? It was Ryukyu Okoku, the kingdom of Ryukyu. So, today's episode of Jin Japan, we're going to talk about that kingdom. Where did it come from? Who was who founded it? What was it like for the kingdom? And how did it, well, end up Okinawa Prefecture? So, if you're interested in that, keep listening to Jarvis in Japan podcast. O tanashimi ni naru hazu desu. So, before we start talking more about the kingdom of Ryokyu, let's talk a bit a little difference about the prehistoric Okinawa than compared to Japan. So, Japan became like a civilized sort of society around、mm, 300 BC.、Mm. They got together, started making rice fields, and they came together, sort of like bringing religions, and then the emperor popped out, he took over most of Japan. And you get like the Heian period of Japan around 1000 BC. But at the same sort of time, Okinawa was still a tribal society. It was still a hunter gatherer society. Because, well, they didn't really need to worry about the change of seasons for like crop cultivation. Because the country, or the island, was a tropical paradise full of plentiful food and supply. And life was good, it was peaceful. It was nice and peaceful. Unlike Japan, that period all got together making rice fields and started murdering each other. Yay! But Japan started trading with China. They got very Chinese influenced. And in the middle of Chinese trade with Japan, there was an island called Okinawa. And the islands in Okinawa got used like a trade port, a middle ground for this trade. And that Started leading to influence from China and Japanese technology advancements from Okinawa, and one of those was crop cultivation. And Okinawans were like, wow, we can make so much more food now. We don't have to like search for it every day. That's great. So they started moving inland, grew together in villages, and people started claiming land. And when people start claiming land, they start killing each other because people want other people's land. And eventually, this led to a period of civil war, and a guy called Shohashi emerged victorious. And he basically took over all the villages in Okinawa, a bit brutally, but he came out king. And he was the king who started the kingdom called Ryukyu. Shohashi, the first s h o w dynasty, started in 1406. And this is when the sort of Shori Castle, the really big castle in Okinawa, Naha City, got founded. But sadly, got burnt down two years ago, but they're still rebuilding it and it'll be back built in 2026. And some facts there. But Shushi, he was a very, well, like I said before, he was a little bit brutal in taking control, but he unified Okinawa. And this was great in the eyes of the Chinese. Because the Chinese, they just wanted the trade partners. They didn't really have to deal with the Japanese because it's like a little bit afar. They could just do it with Okinawa with like halfway and they don't have to worry about the Japanese people. So they kind of really liked this guy. Like so much so they gave him a free trade deal and Okinawa, or the kingdom of Ryukyu, became a central power in Chinese trade. They were like the middleman for most Chinese trade in the Pacific and they made a lot of money. Like, they were the big trade brokers. Like you see probably now, like Amazon, stuff like that. For that Chinese goods, you would, you would go to the King of Ryokyu to get them, and they would send them to you. So it's trading for like India as well, Japan, other islands. So he was doing did a pretty good thing at Okinawa. Okinawa, King of Ryokyu, getting pretty wealthy, especially if you were an elite. And he did very nice things, cultural developments, a very nice castle, Shuriju Castle. But his reign only lasted seven years because he got coup d'etat by a guy called Kinmaru. So, Kinmaru was actually one of his loyal servants, not for the first king, but I think the seventh or the sixth king 
of King of Ryokyu, but one of the kings kind of died, and the next king was kind of a bit of a dick. So the King Maragai was like, I'm just going to take over. And he did, and he did really well, and he took over the country. And basically killed off all the heirs to the first dynasty. But then this guy King Mara was like, no, I am sure, I am sure, I am sure. And it was like, you're not sure, you killed all of Shaw's heir. And he was like, no, but I am sure, if you say I'm not, you die. Okay, you're sure now. So this started the second Shaw dynasty. <laughs> Basically, the guy's not even blood related, but he was like, yeah, I'm king now, I'm him now. You can't say anything about this. And he lasted this dynasty for another, well, 400 years, if I get correctly. Oh, no, be another, yeah. But he was the main, this is the main dynasty who continued throughout the kingdom of Ryukyu, and he was very Chinese and influenced. He was very like the hierarchical society, and we see lots of pictures of like him like a god like figure in Ryukyu, and well, this led to a very hierarchical society, and good if you were a lead person, if you were rich and wealthy, this made a very, very good time to be the kingdom of Ryukyu. Because you get lots of Chinese influence, you get money from China, you get this free trade. It seemed a very, very great time. And this started about 1469, and this continued up in about to the 16th century. Because this... Ah, so it's 200 years of just peace, really. Peace, free trade, and wealth. What's great for an island kingdom. But sadly, stuff happened in Japan. So, if you don't know a bit about Japanese history, in the 16th century, just before that, the 15th and 16th century, Japan was in a state of civil war, the warring states period. And at the end of that, in 16, yeah, in the 16th century, 1600 BC, 400 years ago, the final sort of ruler, Opinar. So Nobunaga took control, but he died, and then his uh, well, his loyal followers eventually took Iyasu took full control, and he basically took full control of the country and led to a peaceful period. But one of the clans didn't really mm, profit from this peace because they were on the losing side. They weren't supporting of the Toga family when they took over. So they kind of lost a lot of wealth. But they still kept going was the southern Kyushu clan Satsuma, which is the current day Kagoshima. This is the southern tip of Kyushu, and they're a very, mm, I want to say, populous place, especially populous with samurai. And this is a very hierarchical society they live in, so samurai can't really work bar murder people and fight. So they had a bit of a problem. They lost all their wealth in the wars, and they've got a lot of these soldiers still lying about. They needed them something to do. And one of the ideas they had to reclaim their fortunes and their wealth of their clan was, why don't we take over these islands called the Kingdom of Ryukyu? Why don't we just take it for ourselves? And that was the, the underlying plan. But they put it to the King of the Tokawa because they didn't want to like, betray him and get the clan destroyed. They were like, why don't we will do the trade of Chinese secretly for you? Because the Japan government didn't really want to be open to the foreign countries. They wanted to be closed because foreigners bring weird stuff and weird ideas and that ruins your peaceful rule. So Tokawa, the family were like, okay, you take them over and do the trade, but in secret. They like, keep it them as an well, independent kingdom, but you rule in the shadows inside. So that was the plan and in 1609, they invaded the kingdom of Ryokyu. And this, well, sadly, they were no match to the what well, battle hard war is of Satsuma. As well, the kingdom of Ryokyu was 200 years of peace. They had an army, but it's more of like a symbolic display. So this kingdom of Ryokyu kind of, sm but they're quite smart about this. They're more like, we can't really beats you, so we're just going to let you in and just make a deal so we continue our trade of China. So they started continuing trade this with China, but now they had another sort of underlying ruler, the Satsuma clan, 
and the Satsuma, they just wanted taxes from them. So, the Rina Ryukan doing trade with China, paying fee for that, and now also getting taxed by the Satsuma clan. But the Satsuma clan were kind of funny about this, because they were like the hidden mafia boss of Ryukyu. When the Chinese came, they would hide the old stuff from the Satsuma, the flags, the people, any of the industry they had in their boats. The Chinese kind of knew about this, but they didn't really care. Because the trade continued, and that's what matters to the Chinese. But in this period to come, kind of led to hard times to the Kingdom of Ryokyu. As Chinese trade kind of diminished as the new Chinese sort of dynasty Xin, the trade kind of went down and they kind of got invaded as well by the Europeans, the Russians, the French, the Americans started cutting up land in the Pacific and in Asia, claiming colonies, and like, well, they had the Opium War of the UK and China, and that led to the demise of the Chinese trade with the Kingdom of Ryokyu. Plus, now they're getting taxed by Satsuma. For the peasants and the normal people, it wasn't so great. And there was just a series of tsunamis as well that destroyed quite a lot of the crops for some of the poorer islands. And the smaller islands, well, I say, well, then became the poorer islands, like Ishigaki, Iriomote, Yonikunajima, and some of the ones in North, I can't remember. And this led to a very brutal taxation system. You'd call this nowadays a poll tax in Japanese, Jintoze. It basically taxed everyone equally. Just basically a village or a family were taxed or how many people they had in their family. This seems equal and fair, maybe. Everyone gets taxed equally. But when you're a poor peasant and you don't have much, well, for yourself anyway, this basically led to them being enslaved by taxation. And let's see, fun things. Uh, uh, this next, no, this wasn't fun times at all. This was quite brutal for those people. So we shouldn't say that. But it led to, like, actually quite a lot of deaths. Where the family would one would get born, two would go off into the woods and not come back, sort of thing. If your lady got pregnant, she would have to jump over the rocks and if she couldn't jump through the rocks, she would fall between them. Well, she wasn't worthy of having that child. This sort of cultural practices, weird stuff like that started popping out. And it wasn't really great because the people were enslaved, basically, by taxation. And this continued until 1903, even after the end of the Kingdom of Ryukyu. So, what happened to the Kingdom of Ryukyu? What happened is the Meiji Revolution in Japan. So when it came Meiji period of Japan, they kind of decided the new Japanese government very modernized. They wanted to control everything by themselves. They didn't want these hands, these clans, to have control of the land, so they destroyed all these clans. They were like, you're going to be prefectures now, and you're going to come together and be centralized. And they kind of went through with that. And for Okinawa, it was... Or Kingdom of Ryukyu, it was a bit of a weird situation because they weren't really a clan, they were an occupied province by another clan. So, first off, they became like, even one in the Kagoshima prefecture, and then it was like, mm, we'll just make you a bit more independent because they were really actually worried about the Chinese would take a claim to the Kingdom of Ryukyu. That was a big issue for Japan at the time, because they're just basically a new nation, all these are foreign powers, they didn't want them to start taking up land, especially like the Russians, the Americans, the British, like, they could take a claim for this, there was lots of boats around there, like, Japan couldn't really do it, so they were just like, you're Okinawa Prefecture now, and the Kingdom of Yoku were like, eh? I'm like, yeah, you're over. No words to say about that. And, well, that happens, and the Kingdom of Yoku was over. In, in 1879, it ended, and Okinawa Prefecture was born. And this led to a series of a little bit of unrest, but it led to more development in Okinawa. So Okinawa Prefecture, you know, they built roads, they built schools, they built better education, but there were things against like Okinawa then, like Okinawan dialects. So if someone's saying speaking Okinawan at school, they would get a bit they had to put like a necklace around them saying like like dialect boy or something like that. So it wasn't it was a little bit bullying, but 
it led to more prosperity for the local people of the land. But it's this gin tour is there, we said before, this politics still continued until 1903. And this was still wasn't great for the smaller islands. I don't really when Japan wanted this basically unify their taxation system did this get solved, not really because it was super brutal, but it was Japan just wanted to be more unified and just get taxation down. Like, taxes. Ah. And that led to the end of the Jin Torse. The poll tax. So Okinawans came a bit more free, and now if you go to like Ishigaki, Yonogunajima, and Iriyamote, you will see lots of these sort of shrines or monuments of this. You won't see them in the mainland of Okinawa. What I found quite interesting, but because this was a quite sort of racist like, tax only on certain islands, so there's one interesting thing to look at if you go to the other islands of Okinawa. There's a dark little history just hidden there of one of the not so good things about the kingdom of Ryukyu. But then it became Okinawa Prefecture and Japan. Well, as you know what happened after that, it led to the Japanese Empire, and they was quite prosperous in that sort of period for the Japanese, but as we know, the Japanese Empire led to the battles in Pacific and the fight of America, and this led to the invasion of Okinawa in the end, and basically Okinawa got obliterated. But this podcast has gone too long now, so we're going to talk about that in the next episode of the Jin Japan Podcast, when we're going to go over the Okinawa War and what happened to Okinawa after then, because it was occupied by Americans for a period of time, and this is a very interesting part of Okinawan history, and I think should be talked about. So we're going to talk about next time in Jin Japan Podcast. All the time, and if you do like Jobs in Japan podcast, please subscribe, leave a nice comment, especially on iTunes. That would mean a lot, so we can make this podcast more popular and better. And I've just been traveling Okinawa, so I've done some, I'm doing some blog posts, and I've taken some recordings of when I was walking around Shuri Castle. So I'm going to do a little post about my tour of Shuri Castle on YouTube and on my Instagram as well. So please check that out, it should be fun. So I mean, it's a psychomatic kid to get it out of here. Don't stop. Join it.